Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this third lecture of Scott Lucas here at the University of Mainz. I will very shortly introduce our speaker uh, and then we will go on with his lecture. Um, I think some of, them already, some of you already know Scott Lucas, uh, who is now spends two weeks here in Mainz uh, as a guest professor. I would like to say once again that he is a guest professor uh, whose, permanence, uh, whose presence here in Mainz has been made possible by the Zentrum für Interkulturelle Studien, the Center for Intercultural Studies, uh, which has a program for uh, a guest professor, uh, which are intended not only to improve the didactic offer here at the University of Mainz, uh, but also to increase the possibility of organizing international research projects uh, on topics which are dealt with here at the University, and uh, we have this great opportunity of uh, having uh, bigger, broader, more interesting international networks. And it's exactly the context uh, of a research project that I started last year, which is, uh, uh, has been uh, offered, let's say, by me uh, for the Department of History, for the uh, faculty number seven, Cultural Studies and uh, Historical Studies, and together with me by Dr. Florian Freitag uh, of the Faculty of American Studies uh, in Gärtnersheim, faculty number six. Uh, the project uh, is uh, dealing uh, with the representation of time and temporality in theme parks, uh, and that's the reason why we have invited uh, Scott Lucas, uh, who is one of the most important researchers uh, in the field of theme parks and themed environments all over the world, I would say. Um, this third lecture is not only therefore offered, let's say, by the Center for Intercultural Studies, but also organized in accordance with the Historische Kulturwissenschaften, which have been interested from the very beginning in this opportunity, in particular in the context of the project called the Geschichtstransformationen, which deals with the transformations of history and representations of history in modern literature and in modern culture. So now a very few words about uh, Scott Lucas, who, uh, apart uh, from being uh, now here as guest uh, professor in Mainz, uh, has uh, studied cultural anthropology at Rice University and has taught anthropology and sociology both at Lake Tahoe Community College and at Valparaiso University. Um, among uh, the different awards he received, I would like still to mention that in 2005 uh, he was the recipient of the Metro Hill Award for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching of Anthropology by the American Anthropological Association, and I think that in this context is an award which is worth mentioning. Um, among his uh, many publications uh, which deal not only with theme parks but also with other topics, uh, I would rather again mention in this context of the didactical aspects uh, connected to anthropology, the edited volume together with Pat Price and David McCurdy's Strategies in Teaching Anthropology, which was published, published in 2010. Uh, when it comes to theme parks, uh, Scott Lucas has the advantage of being not only a researcher in this field, but also of having a direct experience in field work, since he worked as theme park trainer at Six Flags Astroworld, and this gave him the opportunity to uh, see also what is going on behind the curtains, let's say, <laughs> of a theme park. And here, once again, I will simply mention the most important publications, because the publication list is really without an end. Uh, three books that you see also here uh, on this desk, the Team Space uh, 2007, uh, Team Park uh, 2008, and the Immersive Worlds Handbook, Designing Team Parks and Consumer Spaces uh, 2013, so the newest book which was just uh, uh, published. And once again, I would like to mention an edited book, which is very relevant uh, for the topics we're dealing with, uh, which is Fear, Cultural Anxiety and Transformation, Horror, Science Fiction and Fantasy Films uh, Remade, uh, which was published, uh, co-edited with John Armitz, was published in 2008. So, as I said, a very short presentation, because I think that you already probably took part to the previous lectures, uh, the previous two lectures, but Scott uh, offered already here once in Germersheim and once in Mainz. I would uh, once again remind that apart from these three lectures, part of his uh, guest uh, professor here in Mainz consists also in a seminar that he is offering now in the faculty number six in Germersheim. And uh, uh, of course, in the common work on this project about time and temporality uh, in team parks. I would like to thank once again the Center for Intercultural Studies, which is represented uh, 
uh, today here by Frau Spickermann and the Historische Kulturwissenschaften for the support in the organization of this lecture and I don't want to steal any more time for our speaker. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carla, for this uh, great introduction, and uh, thank all of you for, for coming today. And those of you who have been at other lectures, I, I do appreciate you returning uh, for a second or maybe even third time here. Uh, I do want to mention this is uh, available, longer paper. This is quite a long URL. Uh, if you can't uh, see that, uh, you can uh, email me, get my contact afterwards, or you could just go to this uh, academia.edu and search by my name. This is, this is quite long, but you can... Uh, certainly see the uh, full paper there. Yeah, so I'll begin. Uh, in uh, 2008, a theme park opened near uh, Bournemouth, England. It was called Lapland New Forest. According to its website, it promised a magical tunnel of lights, real reindeer, Hollywood special effects, an ice rink, a Christmas market, log cabins, and a slogan of, it's you that makes it beautiful. Up to 40,000 pre-tickets were sold to guests, but in a short time after the park opened to the public, it became a major story on national news. When guests arrived at the park, they discovered there was not a magical tunnel of lights, or there was one, but it turned out to be a six-foot-long white string of Christmas lights strung on some trees. The real animals included some husky dogs in a fenced-off kennel that many guests described as angry and luck starved, and a reindeer with a broken antler. The Hollywood special effects included a cabin with Santa in it and a plug-in stuffed bear as a main feature of the space. The ice rink didn't work and the Christmas market was a structure with a plastic roof and some bins with pound store or dollar store items. When some guests got stuck in a muddy bog that was supposed to be a nativity scene, onlooking elves failed to help out and it was reported that many were seen smoking while in costume. In the end, Thousands of people who had either visited the park or had seen their ticket money gone after the park shut down were left with terrible memories. Two brothers responsible for the space were convicted of misleading the public and sentenced to 13 months in jail. This interesting, curious, and humorous case was originally referenced in the chapter on authenticity for my Immersive Worlds Handbook. In that use, I had focused on how the tragic case of Lapland New Forest suggested to the designer an, an unsettling context in which theming, guest immersion, and consumer authenticity were abysmally and nearly apocalyptically not achieved. However, today in this work, which represents a longer project tentatively titled Towards a Theme Park of Discomfort and the Uncanny, I wish to shift the focus of this apocalyptic sense of the theme park from the emphasis on effective theming and guest comfort to its very opposite. And as my talk focuses on the idea of the theme park as eventually resonating with notions of social justice and politics, I will argue that in order to get there, we need to first divert our representational understandings of the theme park and theme space to the opposite meanings of whatever these commonsensical understandings are. In this slide, I feature the work of graphic designer and artist Thad Donovan. During the time this oil painting was produced, I had asked Donovan to create a series of images that represented, in one way or another, this apocalyptic, oppositional meaning of the theme park. Initially, these represented the struggle I was facing in attempting to best represent the theme park where I was a trainer and also an ethnographer attempting to give voice to the space that I was studying. That looks quite strange with this slide. Uh, th this then evolved into representations of my work as a trainer at the theme park. Uh, scenarios encountered with unruly guests, the challenges of maintaining a sizable and quality employee pool by season's end, the dynamics of, an, of the employee training sessions that I facilitated, cases of me and other trainers scouring over boxes of dis decaying ex-employee papers for lawsuits related to employee matters, the case of a pumpkin head dancer taking down most of the stage during an ill-fated performance, a bird show for employees, Key incidents that would have made George Bataille proud, such as the strange case of the worker who is known as Vomit Boy, and who is strategically used by other employees during employee parties in which the theme park was shut down, 
so that employees could enjoy the rides and attractions, and in which he was known to vomit on every single ride that he rode. And so, on this occasion, some scheming operations employees who wanted to get back at the human resources employees asked Vomit Boy to sit in a particular car just behind those said employees and which resulted in, you get the picture, Overall, these drawings and my narratives and my dissertation reflected what one advisor called the evil underbelly of the theme park, represented here in this imagined basement or catacombs of the theme park. The underbelly suggests that the behind the, the, the underbelly suggests the behind the scenes, the unruly, the disorderly, the unkept, and the many other variations that reflect back on the opposite meanings of the theme parks that I address today. Donovan's oil painting for my work was called Signal 3, which was the title of the dissertation that I wrote on the theme park where I worked. A Signal 3 refers to the radio code that is given in the case of a serious accident, including a fatality out in the park. Pictured here is an email from one of my informants who had direct experience with one such incident. This was the unfortunate death of a maintenance worker who was killed on the Excalibur roller coaster when one of the employees operating the ride had mistakenly given another signal that indicated all clear, which was a thumbs up, or the ride was safe to operate. The accident occurred just after I had left work at the park and I had made some requests of my informants about this incident to get a better sense of what had transpired and also because more and more the work on theme parks was leading me to the idea of death. At the same time, I had been studying other incidents, deaths and cases of mayhem that had transpired at theme parks. The case of the Yippies invading Tom Sawyer Island and most of Disneyland on August 6, 1970. Shown here quite dramatically on Main Street USA and even more so as the riot police cordon off Cinderella Castle. Other cases included the reviews of various fictional and televisual representations of theme parks, a common theme being a terrorist attack, a mad bomber who weaponizes roller coasters in the 1977 film Roller Coaster, whose movie poster proclaimed, watch out for the man watching the roller coaster. Another variation of it in the movie, TV movie Thrill, a park that goes out of control, representations of teenage, teenage onks in the film Final Destination 3, This Ride Will Be the Death of You, and the disaster that takes place in a futuristic theme park in the film Westworld in which the robots run amok. As I have analyzed these and many other cases, the emphases on death, disorder, disaster, and unruliness has led me to an understanding of theme parks through the case of the uncanny, detailed most notably by Ernst Jens in his 1906 piece on the psychology of the uncanny, and Sigmund Freud in his 1919 piece, The Uncanny. When we see, or we see the uncanny when we gaze upon the scenes in which ride accidents occur in theme parks and guests have to be rescued from them. In case, and also in cases like the infamous mouse orgy event, which is hard to see here, in which Disneyland Paris employees recorded a soft core pornographic film complete with bestiality, fornication, and lewd sexual acts. And we see it in cases when a political protest is taken up at Disneyland, like that of the artist Banksy mimicking a Guantanamo Bay detainee. It is worth deconstructing the etymologies, etymologies of both Heimlich and Unheimlich, as Freud does extensively in his piece on the uncanny. I use the German words here for the fact that while the English has the word and common uses of the uncanny, the word canny is less appropriate and even in its use in British English, it is a connotation that takes us far from the meanings that I intend to analyze today. As we can see here in this slide, Heimlich refers to meanings like home, familiar, tame, comfortable, and private while well, unheimlich to unhomey, unfamiliar, unconcealed, and a secret revealed. Which interestingly connects to Freud's notion of the un in unheimlich, and it's a token of repression, with the uncanny being a hidden familiar thing that has undergone repression and then emerged from it. 
Ernst Jens offered that this word, uncanny, appears to express that someone to whom something uncanny happens is not quite at home or at ease in the situation concerned, that the thing is, or at least seems, to be foreign to him or her. A lack of orientation is bound up with the impression of the uncanniness of a thing or incident. As we will see later, I believe that both of these interpretations of the uncanny have great relevance to the achievement of this uncanny theme space. Jens addresses the context of the Tao, or the lifelike figure, which in some cases violates a certain principle of art. And he says, true art in wise moderation avoids the absolute and complete imitation of nature and living beings, well knowing that such an imitation can produce uneasiness. Jens's notion has been explored more thoroughly by Japanese roboticist Ma uh, Masihiro Mori's theory of the uncanny valley, which postulates that robots appearing to be too close to human will be met with revulsion due to their uncanniness. Indeed, in both a practical and a metaphorical sense, the robot is a good figure to analyze as it expresses many of the cultural, political, and existential tensions of mimesis, or imitation. As a way of meditating on some of these notions of the uncanny as they might apply to architectural design and material states, I offer this representation, chart one. I should warn you that these ideas are quite preliminary and the research concepts are intended for a future project, thus their incomplete nature. What I intend here is to initiate a discussion that will eventually lead us to social justice and a return to fundamental questions like, what is a theme park? What is the social role of a theme park? And can the theme park serve ends other than consumerism and escapist fantasy? A curious possibility of the uncanny in an architectural sense, especially as it relates to Freud's uncanny as frighteningly precisely because it is not known and familiar, is found in the curious case of an architectural approach and philosophy known as reversible destiny. The artists, architects, poets, Madeleine Ginz and Arakawa have been motivated by the relationship of the human body to domestic space and the overarching existential concerns of life and death. On their website, which I should say in good postmodernist style is nearly impossible to navigate in a practical sense, as all of the textual links flutter around on the page, they're moving everywhere, and it's very hard for me to actually land on the meaning, which is the sort of a very Derridian uh, notion here of textuality. Uh, so on this website, they, com they proclaim quite profoundly, we have decided not to die. This philosophy of death, its avoidance through inher interior space, is exemplified in this explanation of the Biosclaves house. All your previous expectations of a home, such as a flat floor or the occasional door, go out, go, all go out the oddly placed window at the Biosclaves house. And this is exactly the point. Arakawa and Gins don't want you to be comfortable because comfortable complacency could lead to death. You'll need to stay on your toes to stay, to stay alive. As you may note in these images, the Biosclave House forces people to use strength, perception, imagination, and other faculties to function within the various rooms. According to one commentator on their work, it makes people think, think through what they wouldn't normally think through. A second, equally curious project is the reversible destiny lofts, which like the Biosclave's House, keeps the occupants on guard. Comfort, the thinking goes, is a precursor to death. The house is meant to lead its users into a perpetually tentative relationship with their surroundings and thereby keep them young. The reversible destiny lofts challenge the occupants to interact with the spaces in ways previously unimaginable. Here is one example, quite curious, that defies the typical logic of home comforts, the canny as we have discussed. In this case, you will see near the arrow, Users in the kitchen have to strain in order to access electrical plugs for their convenience needs in the kitchen. While one could view both of these projects in the context of a postmodern parodic winking ploy, I think there is something more significant at stake in terms of the uncanny. Reversible destiny challenges us to rethink the most basic comforts of the home space, in part to say, 
you are dying as you waste away in your creature comforts of home, and in part to say, why not experiment? A second context that I offer today is what might be called colloquially uh, difficult design. By this I mean quite simply a design project such as this chair which reverses the principle of comfort in favor of some other principle. Not necessarily discomfort but let's say some other principle which negates comfort as the primary means of design and interaction with the user. So in this case, a repurposed tree uses the practicality of remaking, of remaking a tree, perhaps at a cost lower than a traditional chair, and combines with an aesthetic appeal to make difficult the typical relationship with the user who wishes to sit down and read his or her favorite novel. Extending this, we may, we may refer to a rather unique design contest called the Unpleasant Design Competition. In this case, contributors were asked to design objects that responded to questions like, can there be such a thing as intentionally unpleasant design? One of the winning entries offered a unique idea for a door lock that requires the user to complete a maze in order to unlock the door, purportedly so, quote, a drunk person or a person who is high on drugs cannot open the door easily and it is also a fun way to secure the doors in public spaces." End quote. Interestingly, the competition also connected to the ways in which current forms of urbanism, especially that of big cities, often create design that is intentionally difficult but for the reason of social control. Mike Davis has written in City of Quartz of the so-called bum-proof benches and other urban design tactics like CCTV or closed circuit television that have at their home or at their heart the idea of unpleasantness, not intended to get people to think about their existential conditions as the reversible destiny project at least in part suggests, but to remind them of their status and to exercise variously forms of social control. Curiously, artist Sarah Ross has invented an Arca suit that is an ingenious response to many of these urban architectural examples of difficult design. Here then, we have the curious contrast between difficult design in the one case as a form of experimentation that results theoretically in the individual realizing new states of being and understanding as a result of the challenges imposed by this design, and then the other as a form of pure social control whose difficulty results in the lessening of the agency of the individual and the heightening of the power of the designers, the operators of the space, and of course the state itself. Interestingly, it is to this last context that we may attribute a second notion of death and perhaps find further direction towards this uncanny theme park. At the beginning of his book Escapism, cultural geographer Yi Tuan notes that the inspiration of his book came when he was asked to write a conference paper on the subject of Disneyland. To his surprise, after visiting the park, he found it to be quite delightful. I say to my surprise because well-educated people are taught to dismiss the theme park as an unreal fantasy world supported by hidden and therefore somewhat sinister forces. My unexpected response led me to ask a series of questions. Granted that theme parks are escapist fantasies, suitable only for the immature, what human works aren't? Is there a ladder of aspiration or pretension? at one of which are the exuberantly or crassly playful and at the other end the deeply serious and real. Suppose I move down the ladder. What comes after the theme park? The shopping mall? I reference Tuan's quote here as I wish, wish to return to the theme of death, a bit different than in the sense that I referenced earlier with Signal 3 or the avoidance of it in the case of reversible destiny. Here in this, in this case, I wish to project as an additional aspect of death, that sort of death that is provided by theory. As Tuan notes in his discussion of the expectations about the critic in relationship to theme parks, much of the literature on theme parks and other consumer spaces highlights an aversion to these spaces, for various reasons as I have stated in both of my previous talks. In The Unreal America, Architecture and Illusion, architectural critic Ada Louise Huxtable offers one of these emblematic reactions to theme parks and other theme spaces uh, as seeing this reflection uh, of the replacement of reality with selective fantasy. Uh, this is a phenomenon of the most successful and staggeringly profitable American phenomena, the reinvention of the environment as themed environment. 
Social critic Grail Marcus, in one of the few essays critical of the theme park critics, suggests that such critiques, and there are numerous of them, are representative of overstatement, simplistic judgment making, simplistic judgment making, and moralism, and inaccurate understandings of popular culture. I think that Marcus is accurate in his assessments of the nature of these critiques, yet he, he is surprisingly vague about where the future of theme parks and their criticism might lead us. Let me then reference this chart, chart two, as I believe that it indicates the problem with both the fans and the critics of theme parks. The theme park here in the middle circle is argued by the fan to be something of an untouchable object. Indeed, for many fans of theme parks and their workers, there are great degrees of devotion that have been attached to everything theme park. I have referred to these individuals in other writings as something of theme park watchers people who look at theme parks, who, le who look them over and all that it entails. And these uh, individuals are no different than the guardians of sacred sites in fantasy novels. To the left circle here, uh, we see the position of many critics, but others as well, imagining a scenario in, sh in which the theme park disappears into thin air, erased from reality and memory for whatever reasons, perhaps not unlike the images of decayed theme parks in my talk on history magic last week. To this right circle here, I suggest a, a, a mediating form between these two options. In this case, we might speak of the reversal of the theme park, or at least its alteration in some way. To this realm, I would attribute the idea of the middle voice, the performative suggestions of the Greek Pyrrho of Ellis, and many others who might challenge us to preserve the life of the theme park, but to demand that it alter its essence and we along with it. And somewhere in this chart, difficult to represent precisely, is the play of reality and imagination, which Freud offered as the key intersection at which to analyze the uncanny, where the lines of imagination and reality are effaced. Yi Fu Tuan, somewhat later in his discussion of Disneyland, offers that escapism is human and inescapable. I find this assertion to be both truthful and troubling. While he is correct in pointing out that all escapism, whether a Stephanie Meyer vampire novel, a trip to the local shopping mall, or a theme park, comes from the same human desire to deal with and perhaps overcome the natural environment, I find it unsettling that we are left only with its inescapability or inevitability. Does the theme park, like other forms of escapism, represent an ultimate fantasy to escape death, mirroring reversible destiny's work and the suggestions of Ernest Becker in his work, The Denial of Death? Could it be that it might be better for the world, quite surprisingly, if critical theory would resist the death drive urge being applied to the theme park and perhaps give the theme park a bit more life? Perhaps in making this statement about the life and the death of the theme park in the theme space, I appear to be nothing short of an apologist for theme parks. As I stated in my talk on researching consumer spaces, I believe that the reasoning behind my position on theme parks is neither purely critical nor purely apologetic. Instead, using the models of ethnographic complicity and the middle voice, I imagine my position as taking advantage of the tension between the death afforded the theme park by the social critic and the, and the life given to it by the uncritical guest who simply enjoys the rides, shows, and foods without ever reflecting on the space or his or her position in it. The tension of life, uh, life and death and many others like absence and presence, self and other, this world and other world, action and inaction, could form the basis of any number of uncanny experiments with the spaces and narratives that are the bases of themed and immersive spaces. Looking back to the history of Coney Island and the many ways that it played off of some of these oppositional tensions, I can only think of the possibilities for further realizations of such experiments in contemporary future spaces. And here then in this chart, we may trace the interesting developments of amusement parks like those of Coney Island, which are represented at the top. Determine how they influence contemporary forms like theme parks, and even project into the future how new theme spaces might develop in these forms' wake. What I might suggest is that we analyze just a few of these tendencies represented in green, and consider how these might be opportunities for the emergence of a theme park or theme space uncanny. Were such a space to develop, 
it would indeed build on the previous precedents of the construction of fantasy and otherworldliness within consumer spaces. It would also connect with the powerful traditions of dark theming and ironic theming that I have referenced in previous talks. It would play off of the role of the guest as the psychological precondition for any sense of the uncanny begins and ends in the human mind as it interacts with fantasy, whether spatial or otherwise. It would address the possibilities of pedagogy or education in a consumer sense for their unsettling, unsettling modes of upheaval. And it would play to the powerful ways in which space can be made more personal and specifically in which it can involve Freud's evas effacement of the real and imagined. Again, let me suggest that the notion of the uncanny that I am offering today is a theoretical construct which may have potential in the future envisioning of the theme park and the theme consumer space. You might be wondering why indeed would the theme park or theme space be geared at the realization of the uncanny and its ultimate representation in social justice. Ernst Jens in this quote here offered that in life we do not like to expose ourselves to severe emotional blows. But in the theater, or while reading, we gladly let ourselves be influenced in this way. We hereby experience certain powerful excitements which awaken us a strong feeling for life without having to accept the consequences of the causes of the, of the unpleasant modes if they were to have the opportunity to appear in corresponding form on their own account. Jens goes on to speak of the reader's psych uh, psychical helplessness in regards to the uncanny in fiction. And Freud offered that there are many more means of creating uncanny effects in fiction than there are in real life. Indeed, to return to the context of difficult space and social control, we cannot, at all levels, escape the existential fact that any space, consumer or otherwise, is necessarily the building up of undifferentiated matter into a spatial project that invokes ideology, politics, and numerous forms of control, all of which will, at some level, impinge on the freedom of individuals using space. I am reminded here of Sartre, who offered that freedom is what you do with what's been done to you. As I move to this image, which is perhaps familiar to you, uh, it's one of a typical in-room hotel coffee from the Radisson chain. I noted this innocuous coffee years back and found it to be somewhat startling. The suggestion here, perhaps made in an all too explicit sense, is that consumers can and should be concerned about the consequences of their actions as consumers. And perhaps you can read here, quality and social responsibility go hand in hand. In a sense, we have a metaphorical uncanny at play in this in-room coffee packet. The consumer staying in their posh hotel room has to come to terms with the fact of reality. He or she is on vacation, but is encouraged to fall back on the real, as if to say, in a Brechtian sense, that the stage that distinguishes the fantasy from the real has to be a race. As Brecht reminded us in the fourth wall, that space that offers the audience the possibility of the suspension of disbelief, it may be necessary to remind the audience member of the fact of their existence as the play on stage becomes meta and the person passively watching is told that she, he or she has a much bigger role to play. This similar demand of the consumer in space may also re result in a metaform of consumerism in which a coffee packet reminds the person of their status as a consumer, a member of a privileged class, and as one who could potentially make a difference, perhaps even through his or her presence in the consumer space. The case of Patagonia's Footprint Chronicles, in which the company tracks the carbon footprint of its products, as well as the working conditions within its factories, suggests that corporate actors play a vital role in a renewed focus on social justice. You may also recall my reference in my talk last week to Team Earth, the space within some celebrity cruise ships that asks guests to consider the consequences of their cruising. One could view celebrities' efforts in a cynical light and argue that they deploy such a space to merely assuage the guilt of consumers. But I think that we instead need to address the changing nature of consumerism and its relationship to space and realize that such new deployments within space are the sign of perhaps an important change.
We might then begin to envision ways in which theme parks and theme consumer spaces might connect to implicit or explicit references to social justice, politics, and meta, meta issues that reference back to the breaking down of the suspension of disbelief for the purpose of promoting something uncanny, a realization of something beyond the codes and expectations of a typical consumer space. I would suggest four specific reasons as to why consumer space will become more closely oriented with an uncanniness that references contexts of politics and social justice. Chart four. First, I would say that the themed and consumer space will become more closely aligned with the world around it. The changing nature of space, alterations of the public sphere, new media and technology, the forces of globalization may result in the theme space aligning itself with the culture itself. I am reminded of the, of the work of Stephen Duncombe who addresses the ways in which politics might fuse with fantasy and spectacle in Dream, reimagining progressive politics in an age of fantasy. And the efforts of, of Michael Hart and Antonio Negri in works like Empire and Mar Multitude who similarly connect the significance of globalization with new political strategies. As well, we might look at how the public sphere is changing. Whether we are aware of it or not, and whether we agree with it or not, more and more the politics of the everyday emerge in the context of late night reality television, fake and comic news like The Daily Show in the United States, video game worlds, and spaces ranging from the lifestyle store to the theme park. In this world, the coffee house and the Tischgesellschaft are supplanted by new consumer spaces which perhaps contrary to Jürgen Habermas's views may become the new realization of the public sphere, not its decline. In a third case, we may analyze how design itself can push the theme park and theme space into the uncanny of the political. Emerging design forms of the avant-garde necessarily challenge the traditions of space. As I mentioned earlier with reversible destiny and difficult design, reorienting the, reorienting the nature of the relationship between the user of space with that space has incredible potential to transform the nature of consumer space. A few simple architectural shifts, alterations of the material culture within a space, or the transformation of a narrative within a venue can have dramatic impacts on the narratives, purposes, and reactions within space, which could in turn reorient the consumer space towards context of social justice. Finally, we return to the context of the uncanny and its narrative and storytelling potential. As in this case of Smart Meme, which envisions social change through the powerful forms of storytelling. Experiments with the nature of the narrative being deployed in a space, such as in the case of metafiction, may result in spaces that have more alignment with the formerly taboo political and social justice topics. As I noted earlier through Breck, the breaking down of the fourth wall has incredible potential within consumer space. Already we see moments of the uncanny in popular culture, as in the example of Marvel Comics hero Deadpool, whose superpower skills include the ability to see beyond the fourth wall and realize that he is quite simply the outcome of the whims of writers and illustrators. I have noted one example of such a meta-orientation to space some time ago when I conducted uh, research at the Holy Land experience in Orlando, Florida. While at the Holy Land, I had the opportunity to visit the scriptorium and part of an exhibit that took guests through a history of the Bible. What surprised me was that at the end of the ride, the space suddenly transformed or changes from the historical biblical settings, pictured in the previous slide, to an everyday typical consumer home pictured in this slide with TV sets, computers, and the like. Here, the potentially jarring and uncanny effects of the attraction are realized as the, as the devout Christian is asked to reconsider his or her own commitments to his or her religion with the sudden contrast between the historical aspects of the Bible and an everyday home-like setting. Of course, all of these spatial politics emerge in a conservative, fairly fundamentalist form of Christianity. So as we will consider later, it is much more difficult to imagine how uncanny, meta, and other experimental spaces will appeal to a wider and more diverse political audience. We do have one case in which politics did play a somewhat significant role in space. We return here to the example of Disney. 
As you may recall from my talk on history magic, Disney is no stranger to the incorporation of politics and social justice themes within its theme parks. Their Animal Kingdom, their Animal Kingdom Park in Orlando, Florida is a curious theme park that combines traditional theme park attractions with features common to zoos and parks like Busch Gardens and SeaWorld. Years ago, author Carl Heisen wrote a critical account of Disney and focused quite extensively on the development of Animal Kingdom. One thing that Heisen notes is how Disney's new theme park represents the idea of improving upon nature. If animals are normally uncooperative in a zoo, train them to do better in a theme park. And if those same animals appear to be boring or are unavailable for the viewing of the guest, redevelop the space in such a way that it is more conducive to an effective viewing of nature and its animals. Much of Heisen's account strikes of the simplistic critiques of Disney theme parks that I've noted earlier. But one thing that I took from the book during my own visit to the theme park was the sense that there are two narratives at this park. One is that of nature, animals, and the human relationship with ecology, and the other, speaking to the meta, is the justification that Disney makes to appeal to the guest and the social critic who might raise the concern, what gives Disney the right to remake nature? I would like to use this question to frame the concern with social justice and theme parks and focus on two specific rides from the park, Kali River Rapids and Kilimanjaro Safaris. In both cases, we see the interesting ways in which politics are merged with the guest experience of the rides and appeals made to guests that differ than those traditionally made in theme parks. On the surface, this first ride, Kali River Rapids, appears to be no different than other water rides. Guests are taken on a journey with all, the, all of the traditional trapping of such rides, which, with bits of uncertainty, thrill, and resolution. Many rides, like Pirates of the Caribbean, use a dramatic structure that referenced Freytag's pyramid as well as Aristotle's notion of drama. What is different and quite curious about this ride lies beyond its dramatic structure, or perhaps I should say is built into its dramatic stu structure. Throughout the queuing areas of the ride, the guest is, is exposed to the meanings and messages of environmentalism, like this one in which the guest might be introduced to the concerns about logging and its impact on the environment within, uh, and within uh, the impact on the environment and also its various species. Later, this message is made more explicit through the presumably cathartic experience of the ride drama. Guests are given opportunities to see the effects of logging and the problems of deforestation. Some have said that Disney's political messages about the environment in this ride and in Kilimanjaro safaris, which I'll get to, and the whole of the animal kingdom, uh, it, it's, it's quite very much too explicit in the sense of being hit on the head with politics. I want to offer this next long quote from Disney's The Imagineering Field Guide, uh, the Disney's Imagineering Field Guide to, to the Animal Kingdom, which was written in 2007. And here's the quote. An adventure with a message. As with the rest of the park, even our grandest adventures are delivered with a conservation mes message woven into them. Here the issue is that of deforestation. We hear hints of the problems in the distant sounds of chainsaws echoing through the queue. There are signs touting the value of the wilderness and warning against deforestation. We begin our travels through this mystical place and are immediately drawn to it. We enter the raft, when we enter the raft, when the raft enters the burn zone where a logging company has been unethically stripping the trees off the top of the, of the mountain, we feel a palpable sense of loss. We see the erosion eating, eating away at the banks of the river. We can't understand how people could go into such a magical, inspirational wilderness and do what they've done. The process is so far out of balance that this environment is no longer sustainable. However, in this case, nature has the last word. The environment is fighting back against this intrusion. The logging truck is teetering on the brink of falling to the rapids because of the erosion of the barren banks. The loggers are not able to continue in their efforts. We are thrown down the great drop and expelled from the area as we imagine the loggers have been as well. Disney's own rhetoric about its park is quite interesting. 
Like many other Imagineering field guides, there is an emphasis on the material and thematic aspects of the theme park. But in this case, with Animal Kingdom, the material aspects are tied to explicit political and ecological interests. The Imagineers speak of a palpable sense of loss during the progression of Kali River Rapids as the guest is brought to connect with and empathize with nature and its animals. And at the end, according to the Imagineers, nature has its revenge, complete with the off-screen death of the evil loggers. The question is, is the guest being hit over the head with political messages that are too explicit? And does the guest, as a result of the ride in the journey through Animal Kingdom, emerge back into everyday life, renewed and reaffirmed in the purification and cleansing of Aristotle's catharsis? We may analyze the second ride from Animal Kingdom that addresses explicit politics. And in this case, it is the issue of poaching that informs the narrative arc of the ride. Kilimanjaro Safaris could be called the centerpiece ride of the animal kingdom. In every respect, it is a remarkable ride that combines technology, animal husbandry, architecture, and performance to achieve affective impact on the guest. Like Kali River Rapids, the familiar structure of pre-narrative in the queuing areas is illustrated by the many placards that express concern and outrage with poaching. Quite explicit here, yes. <laughs> then, quite significantly, in Disney style, we are given references to two animals who have been personalized for the guest, and they are called Big Red and her calf, Little Red. There's an interesting design backstory to this backstory that is worth noting. According to many Disney files on the internet, an interesting version of Kilimanjaro safaris involved a scene in which guests viewed the corpse of Big Red. According to many, during pre-opening market trials, guests were too shocked with the idea of having their children see the bloody corpse of Big Red, and this part of the attraction was removed prior to opening. Now, what's interesting is that when the ride did open to guests, while it removed reference, uh, it while it removed reference to the fate of Big Red and just alludes to her death, it did focus on the plight of Little Red. Guests are given, first, the hints of a poacher's camp, pictured here. And then later in the ride, they come face to face, it's hard to see here, with Little Red, an audio animatronics version of an elephant. And in the particular ride, her tail is uh, sort of uh, wagging here, moving back and forth. And in this case, uh, Little Red has been captured by these evil poachers. Guests, in their ride vehicles, chase the poachers, and in the end, the poachers are caught and the story is resolved in a very happy sense. It gets more curious though. In 2012, these references to poaching and the stories of Big Red and Little Red were all, were all but eliminated from Kilimanjaro safaris. In their place, some rather innocuous zebras were brought in to presumably wash away the political message that wasn't connecting with some guests. Unfortunately, only after four months, the zebras were removed from the attraction due to acclimation issues and were, were replaced with addicts. Jumping back in time uh, to the Imagineer's narrative about the previous political version of Kilimanjaro safaris, we see that the appeal of the original version of the ride was political. It is through this backdrop that we view the presence of the poachers who have intruded into the reserve to illegally, illegally obtain animals for trade. This story is critical to the conservation messages inherent to all of the animal kingdom. When we encounter a violation of this place that has been set aside as being protected by an environmentally connected worldview, we feel the sense of loss deeply. The positive resolution of the story indicates to us that we can make a difference in this question by growing more eyes for poachers. The growing more eyes for poachers, referenced in the Imagineer's narrative quite explicitly, I believe, places emphasis on the guest to not only be exposed to the environmental and social ills of poaching, but to be moved by them in the Aristotelian sense of catharsis. Yet, to return to an earlier point about the reason behind such appeals to politics, some are not so convinced of this emphasis. As one blogger offered, you will see the environmental hypocrisy everywhere in the park. 
Enjoy the Kilimanjaro Safari's message that poachers who kill animals for their hide are evil as you squirm snugly in your upholstered safari bench seat. Take in the animal preservation exhibits as the smell of burnt critter flesh permeates from flame tree, flame tree barbecue and the other meat intensive eateries. No matter where you stand ideologically, no one appreciates being preached one message by the preacher who is practicing another. Some have charged Disney with hypocrisy for raising issues about the environment when, some claim, they're responsible for damaging the environment by building a theme park that pur purports to save it. Years after Carl Heisen's diatribe in Team Rodent, Animal Kingdom has been plagued by problems that are not surprising given the unpredictability, unpredictability of the animals within the park. Another range of critiques of the politics of Animal Kingdom appears more self-serving on the part of guests. Comments like, I've already grown eyes for poaching and for poachers and everything. It was sort of strange and preachy and yay for more animals and for being able to enjoy the elephants without worrying about the fate of Little Red. Uh, these strike me as somewhat depressing. It is, is it too much to ask of a consumer to have him or her reflect on an issue that might actually be important, even though it is, out the, it is outside the context that this person expects within the theme park? So here, we are at a most precarious point. The critics are too critical in their condemnation of the Disney morality play about conservation, poaching, logging, and deforestation in Animal Kingdom, and the guests are too uncritical about being able to see the validity of reflecting on critical environmental and social issues. Where then does this leave us today? I've been studying theme parks and theme spaces for many years. And for me, the possibilities of new and interesting developments within theme spaces and the criticism of research of the re and the criticism and research of them are equally exciting. Recently, I've become fascinated with looking at the historic plans for new Las Vegas casinos that were never realized. What I find so interesting about these images is the sense that they project the notion of a future imperfect. These visions of London of Star Trek, King Arthur and Dragons, the Titanic, a desert paradise, and the moon of all things here, remind us perhaps that the future is equally hopeful and exciting as it is problematic. Two, they remind me of Sartre who said, we do not know what we want and yet we are responsible for what we are. This is the fact. To the task of designing and critiquing the future, we are, if we believe Sartre, given a significant responsibility for that future. Yet we are, at the same time, condemned to our freedom to envision that future. This freedom, which in following Sartre's existentialism is a most precarious one, would require the designer and the social critic, the worker within the space and the guest who uses it, to all act on their potential for the future expressions of themed and immersive spaces. I suggest in this last chart, chart 5, some of the many possibilities that may inspire the theme park and theme space of the future. I will be brief as these repeat some of my earlier points. Consider that the spaces of the future will challenge designers and operators of these spaces to be more cognizant of the relationships of guests within the space and its narratives. And that the meta potentials of space in self-referential and even self-effacing registers will become more probable. That more complex and sustained narratives of space that extend beyond the physical berms of the space itself will become commonplace, such as in this idea I've developed of the life space. That complex notions of politics and not just the hitting over the head type will emerge within consumer venues. That more opportunities for reflexivity and awareness of designer, operator, and guest will be likely. And that the gaps between the social critic and the themed and immersive space designer will lessen. All of those suggest to me the potential of playing out the future imperfect project in meaningful, critical, and even empowering and life-altering ways. Indeed, this is very probable. Let us hope that the newest theme park rides and attractions are as thrilling as the social critiques that will, no doubt, deconstruct them. And let us hope that both are equally unsettling. Thank you.
thank you very much, mm. Scott, for the very interesting presentation. I think we have time for a short discussion, so I would ask for questions. Thank you. I think it may, it's interesting for the people who came, I don't know where they come from exactly, all of them, uh, but uh, the connection um, with what's happening in museums, these spaces um, where you keep the knowledge and where are you going um, sometimes to kind of theme park too. Um, what, uh, is, um, what did you see of kind of museums and maybe in the United States or in different countries yes, yes. and what we are thinking about this? Yes. Yes, I think this is quite a good uh, question and, and two comments that I offer. One is that uh, I, I attend these large theming conferences and there's one uh, for, for a group called TIA, the Theming Entertainment Association, and they do conferences in Europe and the United States. And what is curious is that the designers that come to these conferences represent, I wouldn't say equally, but quite a few from the world of museums. These could be history museums. These could be science and technology museums. Spaces I think that traditionally in the past we thought were more austere and focused on this very pedagogical or educational heavy message or approach. And now with this connection of designers from both worlds we're seeing dialogue between the worlds of the theme park and the museum. And I've said in some of my publications that more and more the theme park I think maybe like in Animal Kingdom, yes, starts to take on this pedagogical message and feels like it's competing with the museum and has to somehow educate the public which is problematic for some people. And then, likewise, then the museum has to use more interactive technologies and theming and immersion that will connect with a guest and clients and people who really wish to have an experience that is more thrilling and less reading off, you know, placards and looking at static dioramas and so forth. So that's the first part. So there's an interconnection of designers in both worlds. So we see an interplay of not just technologies but even narratives, perhaps, that could be appropriate for both spaces. Secondly, is I think we see the, the possibility opening up where maybe consumer spaces, not just museums, will be offering more of this dark, ironic, or disturbing political theming. And if you heard my first talk on Disney's America, I talked about this, and the Disney's America theme park failed in part because people were concerned that Disney should start a theme park that focused on the Civil War. It was too momentous and serious a topic. So what is interesting to me is this tension between a museum uh, like a museum of the Holocaust in DC or in LA, the Museum of Tolerance, that presents deep and disturbing tendencies uh, in American history, uh, in, in European history, and talks about these and gets the guests to feel uncomfortable and really gets them to feel uh, quite in the depressed and existential state the horrors of the past and express those to the guest. So I think when the theme park takes these on, it could be controversial, but it also could be very enlightening, particularly as, to go back to the notion of the public sphere, more and more consumers in the world, maybe in Europe, but certainly in the United States, are getting their information about public life, not maybe from reading great books and going to austere history museums by watching television, by looking at reality TV and playing video games. So perhaps my suggestion, and then maybe this is to a, a apologist, is to say the theme parks and the consumer spaces maybe like this cruise ship, could use reference to social justice and politics and these more dark issues to inform and teach through this new public sphere that's emerging through consumer spaces, perhaps. So I don't know if this answers, but it, this is a projection. It's, this is kind of my future research where I'm headed. And this is my next book project is, is on this very talk which we're discussing today. So this quite, quite in development, I would say, my notions here. Yes? But um, I think, that, isn't it a kind of really postmodern? It's, it's quite postmodern, yes. Because I think um, what's going on in museums in many countries too is going in this direction. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, the knowledge which, which is transferred, you know, is in, in some cases not, not deep anymore. Yeah, yeah. It's something like um, anything goes, you know, and there's uh, nothing you can keep. I think it's, uh, they have to, to um, use uh, things like um, something for, for the eyes, something mm -hmm. because our um, customs are different, mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. yes. yeah. but uh, going on and on and uh, everything, any, 
more postmodern, or oh, I think you, you had some yeah. thoughts uh, coming out of the surrealism. Yes, yes, the yes. I think um, that um, couldn't be the, the right direction for yeah. uh, knowledge transfer in yeah. the future. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is a good question. Maybe if you like, maybe just just, uh, yeah, just yeah. get here also. So uh, I think also that it's very postmodern. Uh, I don't want to say if I see it negatively or positively, but I think we have a clear change in the past few years, um, in, of which theme parks are a part, mm. and some museums. Now, I'm now talking mostly about the representation of history because that's my field, um, in which the interest of for history has not diminished as it was mm. resumed before but has grown in a different way. That's what Vanessa Agnew calls the effective term. So the necessity of living, of experiencing history. So mm. you don't want to read a book about prehistoric people. You want to produce vases. You want to sit down around the fire as they did. You want to wear their clothes to understand. And so we have all these living history mm. museums. We have um, the so-called experimental archaeology, uh, which is very much used also in schools. And I think there we have really this connection between, uh, I don't know if we should call it the team park of the museum or the musealization of the theme park. Mm. Um, if I'm now, now talking about my field, we have mm. theme parks with ancient topic where you have reproductions of archaeological works, statues of temples, and next to them you have the description, like in the museum, saying the Parthenon yeah. was a temple on the Acropolis of Athens and so on. Um, and I see this really as a character of postmodernity, this, uh, let's say, presentification of the temporal dimension, and so we get to my main point. <laughs> this presentification of the temporal dimension, this squeezing really the different levels uh, in an eternal contemporaneity, which makes them usable. But this is, in postmodernity, also connected uh, to a loss of the future. Lucian Pölscher uh, wrote this very nice book about the death of the future mm. of postmodernity, about the fact that postmodernity doesn't allow us, us anymore to imagine a future which is not a hyper technologized version of the present and we have no chance anymore to think of a future which is a completely different uh, social political cultural structure and so i'm wondering uh, uh, when you take about when you talk about the imperfect future how would you connect this with this problem that we have since the 70s at least in imagining a future mm. which is not simply the prorogation of our social and cultural and political structures uh, maybe just with, uh, uh, I don't know, cell phones, which can also be used as razors. Yeah, the Zukunft, yeah. I, uh, the, uh, I mean, this is, I guess I have to be a bit of a futurist here, right, and, and, and imagine this. I suppose, I, I think there's a sense of a future here, but maybe it is this notion of a, a, a future imperfect, where we think about, and these could be the experiences of, of, that we have in everyday life. It could be in consumer spaces, it could be on the internet, on our mobile media. I think my tendency is, is to believe that we will move in this more postmodern sense. Uh, and I go back to 77 to Lyotard's The Postmodern Condition where he talks I think early in the first 20 pages about this sort of new hybrid self that's emerging. And of course Lyotard calls this, uh, he says postmodernism is incredulity toward meta narratives. So what happens is these meta narratives, the grand meta narratives of state, of education, of politics decline, but something does come in their place, right? So it's more micro politics perhaps that emerges. And these are the politics that, you know, uh, Hart and Negri talk about and Duncombe and these other folks. I see a reimagining of a future, but it's maybe not this perfect project of the future where we say, and even architects, I think you have to contend with this, right, in their design projects. Reversible destiny, as I suggested in my talk, is one vision of a future, but it's sort of struggling with a different type of future, this future that's encumbered by this existential concern with death. Um, Brecht, I think, was doing the same thing. So what, what was Brecht uh, projecting in his notion of theater? I think he was saying, we have to develop individuals in everyday life who are more aware of the politics so that they're not just being entertained by what happens on the stage. We break down the fourth wall. We see this in comics, yes. We see this in theme parks and movies. And this sort of envisions, I think, a new notion of a, a new type of consumer. And I think it, in line maybe with Lyotard's notion, the postmodern condition. Uh, but it's not the optimistic future, I would say. But this is okay, and, and as maybe some of you know, I, I kind of tend more towards postmodernism, yes? So for me, this is a happy thing. I think this is a thing that is, for me, the dismantling of truth with the capital T, because I would argue that in the past, all the, maybe not all, but many of the appeals to the truth are... Um, 
caught up caught up in this notion of you know the, the project of the, uh, the enlightenment the, the many projects that have said we envision a better society and look where, where this gets us so I think whether it's a theme park or a new social treatise that a social critic is writing I think we have to be very aware of these politics of the truth the appeals to the truth again as I've said in some of my other talks this this Nietzschean aphor aphorism about you know truths are illusions of which we've forgotten that they're illusions so it, there's a future there but it's not this you know optimistic future I know this goes against Habermas's notion, this you know, incomplete project of modernity and so forth, but I would say uh, the future is here, but it's not the future we're accustomed to, I guess. I guess. So very well with Hilscher who says mm. uh, uh, yeah. we are not able anymore of understanding the future, it's not as continuation of the yeah. present or in this catastrophic way, yes. which is not about the future, it's about mm. the present. So it's mm. a way of saying if we go on doing like this, then we will end up badly. Yes. But that's not a representation of the future anymore. It's yes. a representation of the present in a sort of dramatical way. Yes. And um, I still think that this incapability of um, of thinking the future mm. uh, um, is uh, uh, is quite strong in postmodernism, and and uh, that uh, that this would yeah, this know, is quite challenging. Uh, lead us uh, uh, too far. Yeah. Um, I'm rather yeah, yeah, yeah. I have two questions. Yeah. For you. First of all, thank you very much for this very thank interesting you. talk. Um, my first question relates to the practicality um, yeah. of your proposal. I mean, I, I assume that most agents uh, who initiate theme parks are corporations yeah. interested in profit, right? So yes. it must be really difficult to um, get that. And I noticed that the, the issues, the social and, and ecological issues that were addressed in the theme parks were ones that were geographically very distant from the United States, right? You don't mm. really learn about saving energy. Poaching in Africa, yeah, you know, if you can deal with that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and even if some some bloggers didn't like it, but it's it's still something that. And I wonder, um, have you have you encountered any examples of actual close problems, more pro uh, of more proximity to the social realities of the visitors of the theme parks, such as I don't know, um, ethnicity and social injustice, um, race? Mm, yes, in. Policy. Yeah, it's kind of tricky because again, in the museum certainly, like you go to the Museum of Tolerance, they, they talk about the Holocaust, they talk about Armenian genocide, and they also talk about what's happened in, in the politics of contemporary Africa and ethnic cleansing and so forth. I, I think though, mostly in museums, uh, I would say the celebrity cru cruise ship, and again you could say, well, not too many, when, when we were there uh, visiting, uh, we noted that, my wife and I, that um, very few people were really looking at this, this uh, exhibit. But this exhibit, you know, you type on the computer and you say, here is, you know, the car I drive, and here's, you know, wh where I shop, and I don't know, we, we couldn't get the computer. The computer was mysteriously broken that day, and we wondered, was this because they didn't want guests to really contemplate their carbon footprint, and, and so forth. But there is this movement within the corporate world and it may be in small part but if you look at the social politics of Patagonia you read their literature that they produced you look at their website they are quite focused I think on social justice issues on politics on carbon issues on emissions on the uh, issues related to the the workers in their factories so I would think if more people more consumers align themselves. They even have uh, social apps for your phones now that allow you to shop uh, you know you could scan a barcode and I don't know, maybe if you scan my book because it was printed in China, it would sort of, you know, indicate that it's, it's come from a, a bad factory or something in terms of the social conditions that produced it. But you could scan this barcode and then that would tell you something about the company or the, the big corporation that owns, the, you know, the smaller company or place you're shopping at. So yes, I agree with you. That this is a question of practicality. I think what's needed is a whole scale shift politically and I think this probably has to happen uh, you know at the level of both the corporation, the consumer, um, this new emerging public sphere, if it's a phantom public sphere, a new public sphere that's that's developing. Uh, even Disney I would say you know has been very progressive with social politics towards you know uh, gay and lesbian issues, they've done you know special days for employees and guests and so they've address some you know socio-political issues with their own corporate structure and also within their park so I think it is possible but where, where I don't know and the question mystery is for me and where this will lead me as a writing project is you know how does this happen how does this emerge maybe it emerges also in the home right where we have more of this difficult design or tendencies to challenge your your home comforts or when you travel maybe you know on buses and so forth there, there could be reminders of things that could develop in terms of design projects and narratives and public spaces that would get us to think more about our complicity or our involvement in systems of power and domination 
but yes, practically, I, I don't know how this. I, so, so I can't it, it really sufficiently answer your question because for me, this is the the uh, the seed for the next project. I guess yes. Mm -hmm. Tough questions there. Yes. Can I, can I ask yes, please, please. I was um, really astonished to find out that there's a, a theme park called the Holy Land. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I feature it in the uh, the book Theme Park, and they were nice uh, to give me a couple pictures. And the, uh, th this is a um, you know evangelical uh, Christian uh, theme park in Orlando, quite small. I mean, some people say it's more of a museum. It's one of these hybrid spaces uh, that Dr. Carla talked about when he talks about museums. Uh, and uh, the visitor goes there, and there are different attractions. There's you know a a, a themed uh, cafe where you can eat, and I should say the food was quite good there. It was, it was quite it was quite a nice theme park, and they were very generous and allowed me photos in my book and uh, twice per day they, they reenact the crucifixion of Christ. It, it's quite interesting the whole thing. They have uh, bookstores where they sell creationist literature you know about dinosaurs and humans walking the earth together and all this and so it's I think it's quite marvelous kind of at this surreal level. Um, but I found when I was visiting, uh, I was walking, I told this anecdote in my first talk, I was walking through the park with my notebook and writing things and by the third room in the scriptorium ride that I showed you slides of, these, this elderly couple, very devout religious couple said, are you a journalist? They looked at me and I said, no, I'm an anthropologist. And they said, oh, okay. We thought so because you're writing a lot in your notebook, you know. <laughs> and some of us have encountered this, right? We, we go to theme parks or museums and we're taking copious notes. But um, it, it, it's a very curious hybrid kind of space where for a certain, you know, niche and specific group of people who are very devout Christians, I think it fulfills in this way you're talking about. It's quite Quite immersive. You feel, you smell, you touch. There's a musical they do about, you know, the uh, I think the Gladiator. They they do this interesting musical, you know, with the Romans there, and it's it's quite astonishing. This this whole uh, quasi theme park museum, whatever you call it, yeah. 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 But then again, yeah, so, yeah. Um, I think we, we can have a sort of, of circle. It can mm. be a good, a positive circle, or I don't know. Yeah. But I think if there is a moment in which in, uh, we are experiencing it, in which the fact of uh, producing products uh, which are eco compatible, which do not, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, which are not produced in horrible factors, it becomes really a commercial matter because we have a sensibility among the public and they would buy such products. So, so in this sense, I see a particularity because I can even say, no, but I am morally better than. My, than, than mm, others, yeah. and, and that could be even a winning strategy in the market. And like this, you get a higher sensibilization also of the public, which will request always more of this. So I don't know where it will lead, but, but my point is, in the end, through this uh, uh, affective turn, and through this touching and seeing, and you can have it at the Holy Land experience, the Holy Land experience is probably not so problematic because I think if you decide to go there, you already belong to a special category yeah, yeah. of persons. Yeah. But when we are talking about uh, Business America, which never came into existence, when we are talking about Europa Park here in Germany, yeah. when we are talking about the new theme park which is being built in Paris about Napoleon, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> even if we uh, think as you did that we can have a sort of more critical or less optimistic vision, isn't it always a normative mm. vision? which is presented and which in the end constructs our identity yeah. of, oh, but I am so good because I take yeah, care yeah, of yeah. coaching in Africa. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, um, so in the end, the message is, of course, not an argumentative message, then it must be a normative yeah. message. Yeah. And I fear that the possibility is that we simply draw our normative identity on ethical matters which are not really mm. ethical, mm -hmm. but are ways of shaping uh, yeah. our self-consciousness as members of the Western world. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd say agree completely because I think, you know, what happens is probably what really needs to occur is an increased, you know, emphasis on education in society and less on consumerism entertainment. But my concern is that, at least in the United States, you know, we see education, people are, are being encouraged, I think, less to get a, a degree and they say, oh, your degree will not matter, you won't find a good job, so just go to some technical training or learn in an online class or something like this. And so there's this cynicism about education and more and more I think we see that people watch YouTube and play video games and use mobile media and I fear that the educators and the political people have to then somehow I don't want to say co-opt but enter into this new space where many of the new political theorists are saying you can't be you know the typical Al Gore and say 
you know, typical American consumer, I want to, you to read 50 books on the environment, these really heavy tomes, and, and be concerned about the environment. Maybe instead you have to play that video game. And more video games are focusing on this, right? This notion of morality or ethics or some kind of concern that you have to deal with, what's called serious gaming, if you read Jane McGonigal's uh, book on uh, Reality is Broken. This may be the only possibility, I fear. I, I, I don't know if we can rely on this project of reason and the educated citizenry anymore. I think we have to somehow as political and, and pedagogical actors work ourselves into these new fields. The history museums, the internet, the video games, the poems, the books, the vampire novels, whatever these happen to be. And maybe it's through double coding, you know, and, and you sneak the message in there like they do in these shows like The Simpsons or so forth where you sneak in a secondary message that can appeal to the more educated political consumer and then you have the fun entertaining, you know, the, the mouse and the, 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 the cat are hitting each other, beating each other up, but there's this like really Marxist message beneath it which reminds me a little bit of the situationist and de tournament and this idea of co-opting the media for your own political uh, messages. But yes, I, I, I don't know what will happen in this field. This is too... No, no, it's perfectly real. Yeah, yeah, you I don't know. Our, it's our duty no, no, no. Really to use these uh, uh, opportunities to, to break through, let's yeah, say, yeah, yeah, our message. Yeah. I'm just uh, scared that, especially when we come to these ethical questions, it will become really a, simply a new way to say, I care, it's yeah. a form of self-representation, yeah. which doesn't really then yeah, yeah. mean anything, but will only be a way of putting our conscience to silence yeah. uh, and in creating a new, no, a new caring normality, yeah. which yeah. in the end uh, yeah. uh, uh, won't be very much anywhere, but, but maybe that's again yeah. a topic that is too broad yeah. for... I think we should have taught another class on it could be designing the consumer space of the future and we could all collaborate and uh, think of what this might look like. You yeah, know? Because I'm thinking also of the theme parks uh, which are especially devoted to the creation of national identities. Yes, yes, yes. And, and, and they have really have yeah. these extremely yeah. normative messages like yeah, this yeah. park in Spain we were talking yeah, about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You go there and you see Spain is the yeah. end product yeah, yeah, of yeah. the Mediterranean civilization and we and we are all natural yeah, yeah, and yeah, we all yeah. know what honor is and, yeah, uh, yeah. and so on. And your uh, Europa our, Park our is like this, yeah. Our women are, 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 are warriors yeah, who yeah. can send the Romans away yeah, yeah. And, and, um, <laughs> and <laughs> I don't know if Animal Kingdom uh, doesn't in the end produce mm -hmm. similar mm -hmm. on another level. Yeah, I think it may. So, are there further questions? then I would thank you once again. Okay, thank you all for coming, yes. Thank you.